Shaw. I'm Stephen Hewlett. Welcome back to another episode of The Computer Mechanic, taking your calls at... 1-888-ROGERS-8. Uh, your calls with computer problems and suggestions uh, yeah. uh, about computer systems, help. preferably not about us. Help. <laughs> help, yeah, help. <laughs> help. One help thing, the one thing to mention this week, uh, not to uh, try and defend ourselves, but somebody left a message on the message board. Right. And it seemed to stir off other people answering and it was about that we hadn't got back to an email that was sent and posted. Right. Now, I actually did a search and I found that person had visited our th message boards. We have three message boards. Right. We have the computer mechanics uh, get help message board where a lot of people, I mean, we've got Walter out there. There's just so many people to, yep. to answer out to. Rickstead's there. Rickstead. Uh, they try and help out each other and that's what it is throughout the week because we can't be doing this 24-7. No. We'd like to. Yeah. Exactly but there's okay. there's certain things like yeah. jobs and family that seems to cut in there. Exactly, yeah. Sleep. The <laughs> sleep, yeah, sleep yeah. is important. Unfortunately. So for the most part, we moderate the message boards throughout the week. Right. And a lot of people are out there helping out. Now every now and then you get a bad apple that's trying to cause mm. problems and we right. to remove it. But the best way to leave messages is to leave polite messages. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean as long as you're not attacking anyone, no one's gonna attack you back. Right. Now, so there's also some people get to the point where they're just, there is no, this is the end, they've done everything that they know how to do. And you can understand that frustration. And like we've always said, if you're getting nowhere, the squeaky wheel always gets the oil, right? So are we saying, well, well, hey, well, that's what what's I, happening. What I so. did look is I, I actually <laughs> looked up to see what the problem was. Now, right. this person had contacted Microsoft about the problem. Mm -hmm. Microsoft had said there was no fix for it. And that's what I got out of the email response that I, I had looked at. I actually did a find. Because we're getting about 150 to 200 emails throughout really? the week, yep. um, and we normally reply to 25 to 50 of them. We can't get to all of them. Right. So that's why the message boards. That's were why put the in message place. boards were there. Right. Now what we've done is we've actually set up on our website this week is where you can get support. Where Stephen and I actually go off Microsoft TechNet. If you register for that, they have really a lot abundant amount of information about Microsoft problems and computer problems. Yeah. Uh, the other two that we have up there this week is Zednet. Mm -hmm. They have an extensive place to go out and get support and, s and solve problems. What we would ask is that you visit our message board after the fact mm -hmm. and, and leave how you solved your problem or solution. That's right. And it yeah, helps exactly. out everyone. It gives direction to other people mm -hmm. where they can go to get more information on something that may yeah. be related to them, their problem. Exactly. Right. Excellent. Okay. And the first person we're going to speak to is, uh, we've been doing Microsoft products, that's yeah. all we have here yeah, on the Windows show. Yeah, 95, 98, stuff like that. We get some questions about Linux and different... Nah, stuff like that. Yep. <laughs> so I have a friend that... I have a friend. You I have, have, yeah, I whoa, have a friend. One friend. But I have a friend that has actually done the installation of the newer version or newest version of Linux. Right. And his name is Chris Greenwell. Right. And we have him on the phone to talk about his installation and how easy it was for him. How easy it was. Because we've heard some people that have gone through the installation mm -hmm. and more or less had failure, so. And he, he is the, now he's not running dual operating system, but he is running dual processors. Dual so. processors, so he's got it on a, sis, a separate system. Yes. Okay. And we're coming to you not via satellite, but via telephone line. Let's see, do we have Chris there? Yeah, guys, how's it going? Pretty good, good. how are, are you? Yourself? Excellent, excellent. All right. And you're gonna talk to us, so you did an installation this week. Yeah, I did, I put on the, uh, the new Red Hat uh, 6.0 uh, Linux 2.2.2 uh, kernel. Okay. Uh, and it uh, it was a flawless install. It was really nice and smooth and uh, nice graphical interface on it when you run X Windows on it. Uh, I can see it starting to give Microsoft a real run for its money because uh, it doesn't cost anything. <laughs> now, now when you, you said you did the install and it was flawless. Um, now, is it, it consists of a CD, I believe, and some diskettes? No, actually, this time I, I did a really cool install. What I did was I linked it. I have my network card and I have my Rogers at home. Uh -huh. And I used my, my Windows machine as a, a, a NAT gateway. Okay. And then I just all I had to do was download a, a boot floppy disk, create the boot floppy disk image, right. throw in a couple of uh, IP numbers, uh -huh. and I did the complete install of the complete package right through the Internet. I didn't have to download a single thing. Okay. It completely installed, formatted my hard drive. Now, is this something that's available for... Anybody that would want to do it? Yeah, anybody can do it. Yeah, anybody can do it. They can go to the uh, the, the Red Hat uh, now the ftp.redhat.com. Okay, that's it's probably very very that. very full. Okay. I okay. suggest that everybody go to ftp.crc.ca and that's the Canadian area there. 
Okay. And CRT there they're going to go in. They're going to have to go down a few levels. Uh, I think it starts off mirrors, then by site. But they can get the actual uh, listings in off the Red Hat site. There's a there's a, a menu there called mirrors, and what they want to do is go to the Canadian uh, mirror to download it from. Okay. What what are they going to notice? What what do you find about Linux that you're liking? Um, okay, well, first of all, it's free. <laughs> yeah, that, that's good. <laughs> free is a good price. Well, it's, I mean, when you're, you got to consider in a large uh, environment where you have multiple, multiple machines, uh, an NT license is very, very, very costly. Mm -hmm. When you have 20, 30 machines in there, you're looking at a very, very large expense. Okay, but for the novice, what about the learning curve? Well, I mean, once again, it's, uh, it's definitely a little bit steeper, but in the overall aspect of, 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 once again, of cost reduction and saving and how much you learn, uh, you're much better off. It, de it really depends on what kind of user you are. If you want to just get right. onto it and use it, then you're best off for sure with, uh, with Microsoft or even at that point the Macintosh. I mean, yeah. So what, um, what, what do you think if corporations or businesses were thinking about going to this operating system there are uh, few now. for uh, Oh, they, they are definitely going to start doing it when they start uh, looking at the cost of, uh, I mean, right now it also now has, the reason that was what was really holding Linux back before wasn't just the, the user interface and such like that, but it was the dual processor support or the more than one processor support. Mm -hmm. Okay, now you're, you're running dual processor support now, right? Yes, yeah, and it's very, very smooth, and it's like, I mean, I just have a dual 133, but it's actually running a lot faster than it did under NT under the same circumstances, a lot faster. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. And, it's, it's and, and you did mention X Windows. X Windows, yeah. Well, X Windows is a, is a base shell that you run a whole bunch of other uh, shell windows on top of. Uh, they're called, like, Genome uh, After Steps. Um, and KDE right now it comes base installed now with uh, genome okay 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 Chris we're gonna come out and videotape you and have you on the website next week talk a bit more about it okay great guys. I appreciate it thanks a lot okay thanks a lot. take care take care okay and a little bit of information there so we'll get we're gonna go out do take some filming do some filming some take a look at it put it on the website and so they hit our website for yeah people to uh, Go to. One thing I mentioned was that if I had decided not chickened out to go someplace last week, I was going to put it on the website. I did chicken out. So you did. I did. Yeah, and we'll admit did. it right here. We did. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Okay. First caller is Joseph. Joseph. How are you? Pretty good. good. How about yourself? Oh, not too bad at all, thanks. I recently installed a network card. Uh huh. And uh, at first everything worked fine. Then uh, it stopped. I uh, contacted customer support for the card. They say I have a conflict between my video card and the network card. Okay. He says to either uh, take the network card out and uh, move it up on the PCI bus or uh, do the opposite with the video card. Mm. Now, is there any way I can get away around this without moving anything? Okay, now is it an IRQ conflict that you're having with the network card? Uh, I think so, yes. Okay, because what you may want to do is if you go into your CMOS of your computer, mm -hmm. a lot of the times you'll see an area where it actually says if the VGA card should be assigned. Right. Okay, now is it an, an a IRQ? An IRQ. And if you tell it not to assign an IRQ to the video card, that hopefully should help. That okay? would, eh? That's right, because your video card actually doesn't need that IRQ. No. So what what kind of system are you running again? Well, I'm uh, the uh, the gateway is a Pentium 2350. Pentium, Pentium 2350. And then you're the probably uh, client is a Pentium 166. Okay. Okay. Wh which one are you having the problem in? Well, I can uh, get information off the Pentium 166, but uh, I can't get anything from the uh, Pentium 2 to the 166. Hmm. Okay. I'm All e the protocols on each system are the same. Well, it's it's a phone line uh, uh, network card. Um, phone line network card. Phone line network cards. Have you seen those? Actually, those are the ones that you can purchase and use your in internal wiring of your phone system. Yeah, that's it. To be able to send data, and I believe that you run at 10 MIPS. Uh, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, Still same idea. Sa no same difference. same idea. Okay. But what I what I'd recommend doing a lot of the times you can actually go under control panel. If we can go off to the computer for a moment, and if I can. We'll see if it pops up here. What I'll do is I'll show. I'm not seeing. I'm not seeing it right at the moment. Uh, but if you go under Control Panel, 
Device manager? Yeah, into the device manager. Yeah. Okay. Now, when you go underneath the properties of that, you should see an area where it lists the IRQ that your network card is using. Okay, yes. Okay. There should also be a box below that that tells you what your network card is currently conflicting with. Okay. Okay. Now, write down that IRQ because if this doesn't work, we're going to try one other thing. The next thing to do is to arrow up and try and change the IRQ of the network card. Because if it's a truly plug and play network card, you should be able to change the IRQ from within the Windows operating system. Okay. Okay. So try that. If that doesn't work, again, go into the CMOS and tell it not to assign an IRQ to the VGA card. All right. Okay. And if, if that's not working, then you may want to go into a section in your CMOS find the IRQ number, there's a listing of IRQs and whether or not they should be available to plug and play cards within your computer system. Find that IRQ, it's listed, there's a whole bunch of IRQs there, and tell it not to be available. Okay. And that'll force your cards to go out and grab another IRQ. All right. And hopefully that'll avoid the problem. I appreciate your time. Okay. Thanks Good. very much. Thanks very much. Bye. Good luck. Uh, again, we've got the support lines. If you're not getting, well, what I recommend about our message board, if you go to the message board, leave a message, you'll normally have three or four people help out. Sometimes there are questions out there that aren't answerable. Then right. you go off to different locations uh, to find the questions. Uh, Microsoft, Z ZDNet, yeah. and I, CNET. IRQ problems are relatively simple to solve, yeah. actually. It's just a matter of changing those numbers around like you were selling them. Yeah, and, and so. uh, you always get two COM ports of your computer system. Right. Now, the likelihood but is older ones are using the mouse off the COM port, so mm -hmm. COM1 is taken. And if you're not using a modem, it normally means that COM2 is available. Right. And so like you can disable that and get back an IRQ. Like for instance, on my, even on my PC, I have uh -huh. two uh, devices that are using IRQ9, but they have PCI steering, which allows them to share those that IRQ9. So and that's also... A that also solves it sometimes too, it's on its own. It does. But no, I haven't sometimes. seen those particular telephone Right, so you don't know exactly cards. what kind of But I, I have had a lot of people to. email us that uh, they're working and they, they work well. Excellent. So, okay, we'll go off and we'll speak to Sean. Sean. Hi, Sean. Hello. Hi. How are you? Oh, I'm fine, thanks. So, uh, I got a hard drive problem. Okay. okay. Um, I just finished doing an MS-DOS scan, uh, scan disk. Yep. And I had 10 bad sectors before, mm -hmm. and, well, I downloaded the, um, an EXE program that uh, does a diagnostic on it. Okay. Okay. And they told me after the diagnostic that it was probably, uh, might be a cable problem, so I took the cable off the CD-ROM and hooked it up to the hard drive. Right. Okay. And I did, and I did the program again, it, it ran fine, it said there were no errors, so then I... The, I realigned the, like the cable on mm -hmm. the motherboard, and I hooked it back up, and I ran the EXE pro program again, and I had the CD-ROM and the hard drive hooked up uh, at, at the same time, and it said that there was still no errors on the hard drive. So I installed my Windows, mm -hmm. and right after I did the install, I, I ran the scan disk again, and the same 10 bad areas came back up. So you, you actually... When you ran the scan disk, there was little blocks that had a red B in them? Yep. Okay, so that's physically bad sectors on the drive. Right. Now, and you, those can those sort of, you can sort of cover those up. If you were to re-F disk the drive and reformat the drive, then um, they would disappear because then it would be marked as bad sectors. Right. But probably what will happen in the future is that drive is, is going to fail. It's going to continue to do that. So right now, you're putting data on a drive that is potentially going to crash at any point or it could last 10 years but it's really hard to say so it's I would probably recommend a new drive at this point yeah it, it when, when you start getting bad sectors now one of the things to note that even though your computer system may have a warranty of say a year or two years right that internally the equipment that they set up is hard drives will sometimes have a much three longer years. warranty three years usually. it does I, have a three-year warranty on it I called them today and Right. I didn't want to send it back to them if there were, they were going to send it back saying there was no problem. Oh, yeah. they'll, they, um, they, they'll see the bad sectors, okay. and, and they will... But they after I ran the EXE program, there, were, there weren't any bad sectors. Well, the, the fact that that B is there when you're doing the scan disk, yeah. it, and it, they normally pop up instantly, so your operating system already knows that there's bad sectors on the drive. Mm. 
So they've kind of been flagged as bad sectors. Well, I understand, but the... But what, what was the execution program? You're, you're saying execution it's program? It's a WD Diag from oh, uh, Western Digital. Western Digital Diag? Yeah. Okay. Now that may... It, well, I guess it would be a Western Digital Diag. They gave me drive, the right? option to rewrite the hard drive with zeros. Right. To totally okay. clean it out. Yeah, see, there should be... No, there's no way to get I rid of a bad sector. No. unless they actually change the platens that are inside the drive. So, yeah. So if you did see those bees, then, and you didn't see them when you ran the Western Digital software, but you saw them again when you ran Scandisk. I ran the EXE program, and it picked up the bad sector, so I didn't want to take my information off. Right. Mm -hmm. Then I re-ran... Scandisk. Scan no, no, no. I ran the uh, EXE program rewriting the hard drive with zeros. Okay. Uh -huh. Then it came up that it was fine after that. Okay. After yeah, I can't, I can't explain why the first one reporting it's fine. But, I, but if you did originally have bad sectors, then there was a reason why those bad sectors were on there. Either because there was a piece of dust in there that's been floating around. So that's all it really takes to go underneath the, the hard drive head is a piece of dust. And but that will just leave a little scratch. The bad sectors yeah. turned up in both, both, in exactly the same spots in both times. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, because I'm, I'm also leaning towards that possibly the software was reporting that the available space that was there was fine. But of course, the bad sectors, because when Scandisk pops in and you automatically see those bees, um, it's already flagged them. So the software could be avoiding where it's already flagged and, you know, yeah, kind of reaching possible, there. Yeah. But I do believe that you should look at the warranty and, and have the drive replaced. Because if you have bad sectors, all that will happen is they'll grow yeah. over they'll time. Replace, they'll replace the drive anyway. Okay, okay, thanks yeah. a lot, Good luck. guys. Good luck with that. Okay, bye. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay, and we're going to go off and speak with Matt. Yeah. Hi, Matt. Hi there. How are you? I'm pretty good. How can, how can we help you today? I was just, I had a couple questions about buying a new computer. Okay. Okay, me and my dad are buying a, a new computer, and I play a lot of games on it. Mm -hmm. So we were just wondering uh, if we should get a CD-ROM drive or a DVD. Mm. Mm. Um, I, I haven't I haven't seen a lot of I, I just purchased a DVD myself creative mm -hmm. um, I've got it connected up to my television so that I can actually watch movies and it came with uh, Wing Commander which was a DVD game mm -hmm. and what all basically the DVD game did was interact real video like the movie in yeah. fact the guy that played uh, uh, yeah. Luke Skywalker in the original Star Wars oh okay uh, I should know that name <laughs> then I don't <laughs> but uh, that game was okay, but I haven't bought a lot of software that's DVD. Mm -hmm. Unless you plan on playing a lot of movies, that's when you might want to consider DVD. Oh, it's okay. going to be about another $200 more than so just a regular CD. Okay. Probably your, your dad wants the DVD drive, and you want the gaming. But you could use the DVD drive for every, everything, because if you purchase um, one of the latest, is the sixth generation DVD drives, mm -hmm. on regular CDs, the regular are 24 spins. Yeah. So and there's six for DVD. And so and you're gonna have plenty of speed. Absolutely, yeah. especially if you get in a new system. If you have the extra money and you want to stay as current as possible, and the neat thing is, if you do like watching movies, it changed the whole yeah. concept whole of watch. Aspect, yeah. I'm getting uh, Dolby Digital uh, surround audio sound. surround sound connected up to my surround sound system. Uh, I can also do a really neat thing is when I'm watching a movie, is I can click over to the audio side where the actor might. Uh, say Austin Powers, I'm choosing that one, <laughs> where uh, Mike Myers and the director are actually talking about different scenes. I can go to different chapters, just things you could never do with VHS. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the DVD really is a great yeah. way to go to. Um, the one thing you do lose, as Steve had mentioned, is 24 spin, which really isn't a big deal. Yeah, that's fine. But it is about $200 more than a regular CD-ROM. Right. Okay. Okay. And what's the difference between a Pentium 2 and a Pentium 3, really? Is there much of a difference? Pentium 3 is actually being promoted more for the, the heavy gamer, yep. mm -hmm. okay? Someone that really wants to get into their system and get better graphics and better sound. Uh, and if you are going to be a gamer and you're entering the market and you really want to be able to buy every game out there and get the best out of it, mm -hmm. as software starts to develop, then I'd recommend going into the Pentium 3 area. Okay. Yeah. The other thing you can do, though, it, it really depends on your budget. Money is important. Right. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. why Linux is free and it was a great price. <laughs> uh, but yeah. you're definitely not going to get a Pentium 2 or a Pentium 3 free. No. Uh, no. But as they come out with faster Pentium 3s, you're going to find Pentium 2 computer systems come down in price. Yeah. 
Yeah. You're going to also find lower end Pentium 3 systems come down in price. They already came down. Yeah. Pentium 3s came down in price like majorly. Yeah. So, so don't you don't have to come into the market at the highest and fastest. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's always the best. That's up to dad. But you can yeah, it's <laughs> up to dad and his and and your allowance. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but if you want to put together, I mean, <laughs> well, depending on how they're doing that. Yeah. Okay. If Dad's paying for it, I'll go for the most. <laughs> okay. 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 Thanks. Okay. Good Take thanks. care. Good luck with that. Bye. I thought it was making sense, sir. <laughs> and then if he's going to get all that, he's going to get a Pentium two, Pentium three yeah. DVD kit. He's got to get a Voodoo three card. The vo the Voodoo, Voodoo three. They're not actually, the best one, but the the Voodoo, there is a the Voodoo three out there that also has TV out. And that's that was, was my largest problem. I was looking problem. at it today, and it was the Voodoo 3 3000, okay. and they also have the Voodoo 3 3500, and currently at the price was about 274, which is a really good price. So, so you can also and watch, it has watch, watch video TV, out. S video out, and right. also has a built-in TV system. No. I'm understand because I know that the a I, the ATI All in Wonder one, one, one in 28 of. is coming out that has all of it, and it has a separate box. So if you are using this card to output video or to receive video or to watch TV, the neat thing is that you now plug one cable into the card and you put a box so all your con you don't have to crawl under the desk every time you're changing connectors. That's a good idea. So, and we're gonna go we don't seem to have a caller listed right at the moment. Uh oh. You know why? Steve okay. is the next caller. Steve is the next we're caller. We're gonna speak with Steve. Hi, Steve. Hi, guys. How are Steve's you? He's the only one not gone away for a long weekend. Ah, uh, well, <laughs> had the golf today. Oh, did you? Yeah, and oh, I'm okay. going to the rodeo tomorrow. Oh, okay. Rodeo, rodeo. Found that out uh, a little conflict with the Leaf game, but uh, what can you do? Yeah. Okay. Well, we've been up against Hockey Night in Canada, I believe it is, for the last, uh, the season. But yes. Yes, exactly. What can you do? How can we help you, sir? Uh, a couple things. Uh, number one, um, I've got a, a Sound Blaster 64 card. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, whenever I exit out of any programs that's, uh, that basically use the sound card. It seems to set the uh, the wave volume down to zero. You know, like if I go into uh, uh, my TV tuner after I exit the TV tuner, so I'm constantly going in and having to put the volume back up. And even if you click on save, it still drops it. Yep. Uh, I have exactly the same problem. And you know what? Yes. Did he say the ATI player? Yeah, whenever he Mine launches, too. yeah, the exact same problem. I, I actually, it, it was. I find it very annoying because you launch the TV tuner, and I guess it's trying to get rid of background noises so that you can watch the video. Yeah. Okay. Or play CDs because hmm. the ATI, I, I even have it here, but it does. It pushes your wave volume right to the yeah lowest. Right. So every time that I want to listen to a wave and watch the television in the corner or do video editing, you've got to turn it up. Right. So he calls in with this problem. We have the same problem. and still haven't got an answer. Well, <laughs> okay. at, at, le at least now we know we're not the only ones. We don't want to admit to it. Yeah. <laughs> you were uh, supposed to help me. <laughs> I, I don't believe there's a fix to it. I went to the ATI site. Yeah, I, so did I am still waiting for tech support to get back to me. Um, I emailed the computer mechanics, and they haven't got back to me as of yet. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, I have exactly the same problem. I believe it's built into the system. Yeah. Is, now, would that be maybe considering a, as a, a feature that would save your speakers because if your wave is cranked and you automatically bring up a television show yeah then it could do some da damage I know Les has done it actually <laughs> I've done damage yeah. but I, I actually every time I launch the TV I d same thing happens and it will uh, put it right down to nothing um, how to fix that we're still waiting for an answer okay okay if anyone out so there has an answer I'm gonna hit the message board and not only will you have to leave the answer but it'll have to work here okay. yeah. we're uh, looking for that too all right. Another quick thing, hopefully. Yep. Okay. Um, uh, since getting into MP3s, uh, um, I've, uh, I I want to upgrade my sound system. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got a Sound Blaster 64, and I've got some pretty cheap speakers. Right. Um, I saw you guys, uh, or I kind of missed the, when you reviewed the uh, the Microsoft Digital Sound System. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very nice. But um, like. What's the way to go? Like, do you go high-end sound card with really good speakers, or I think you're right. You I, I I like the speakers. They're great for what I'm doing at home. Yeah. Uh, they will run off USB, so you don't even need a sound card. Yeah. But you have to make sure that all your components are actually digital within your system. Yeah. Uh, so you're actually still doing all your recording and such through your sound card. So I also have the 64. Yeah. Um, I'm pleased with uh, the speakers plugged into my sound card not using the USB function of the Microsoft digital speakers. 
and only using it when I want really crisp sounds. I believe going with a high-end card, which uh, the live card from Sound Blaster, yeah, live, yeah. Live, yeah. Uh, everyone's been very pleased with it. Mm -hmm. um, and going with uh, some high-end speakers, depending on what you want. If you want surround sound, they uh, on the creative site you'll even see speakers they supply that have the four speaker system. Yeah. Okay. And also depends if you go into the live, you can go into the live where it's set up for MIDI, so you can plug your right. keyboard in if you want to go to that extent. Yeah. So, That's but I, yeah, I recommend not just buying the Microsoft speakers, but getting a a good sound yeah. card, which the 64 isn't bad. Yeah. Uh, but the live definitely is better. Okay, great. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks Thank a lot. You. Good luck. Right. You're what kind of speakers are you running at home with the, the Altec subwoofer? All tech yeah. Lansing. And they yeah. were probably about 100 bucks or so. 120 right. bucks. I, I feel so sorry for my neighbors because I have the All Tech Lansing over here because yeah. I ran those, and I also mm -hmm. have the Microsoft, and I also pump it through the stereo. Right. So yeah, uh, you're loud. <laughs> so we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna quiet down as well. Right. Uh, we're gonna hit the message board and take a look what everyone out there is saying about what's happening here. And we've, we're on, if, can we go out to video? Are we getting video out there, Chris? If we could, please, yeah. And we just want, so I want to show what's on the website here today. We have a stand-in producer, somebody that was our producer yeah. last season. Opposed to our sit-in producer. Opposed to our <laughs> sit-in producer. Because <laughs> some people get long weekends. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not us. There we go. Are we, so we're, we're out to the, people can see that? That's good. Okay. we can't. So I can't see it here, but it's going to be quite it. So what we've set up is a link to the ZDNet site where you can go and get support, uh, leave questions. They have a lot of tips. And uh, on the other site, we also have a link to Z CNET. Now, for the game of the week, we've got Formula Racing. Very good download. Highly recommend it. And their makers, EDOS. We're going to see you very shortly. Right. After okay. This. Right, and we're back again. All right, now we can see us too. Okay, so now <laughs> now we go off to the computer, and he's doing a really neat thing here. Okay. If we can go off to the computer there, Chris, and we'll show show the website here. And game of the week, question of the week. Game of the week, question of the week. Uh, do you believe that Microsoft is over dominant, meaning taking over the uh, the software industry and such as mm -hmm. well? So far, we've had we're about to, we're doing it live here. Fifty four people respond. Right. Uh, with a yes, and 11 people no, and 35 says uh, leave Bill alone. Leave, leave okay. Bill alone. That question was submitted by Lance, and right. you'll, you'll be able to see it there. On the same Microsoft theme, I guess, uh, Rodney sent me in uh, a Bill Gates 
with a new agent file for 007. Feel free to go and check that out. Quite humorous. Uh, and the other thing that I've done is, again, we've listed all the support sites that you can go and get help. If you do get help, come back to our message board, leave it so other people can uh, see the answers as well. I've linked to two viewer websites. One of them is by a gentleman that sent me, named Collie. He had sent me uh, uh, a, a, his website. I went off to it. He's got things uh, such as Volkswagens, and it was quite cool. I thought we'd put it up. And then we've got Catherine. Catherine has been on our message board for a long time. She's yeah. always out there helping people, very polite, kind of people we want on our message That's board right. regularly. All and she time. has a site where she's gone off onto the internet and gathered different types of information to help new and advanced users. And actually, it's, it's very well written mm -hmm. uh, and put together. And you'll find just tons and tons of information on cyber addictions and uh, online relationships and Modem. when you're chatting Laugh with there. people what the little codes represent like oh. lol stands for laugh out loud ha 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 uh, uh, i thought it was lots of laughs oh. but okay <laughs> so you can go and see what the real ones are uh yeah, so we there's a lot that. of different sites that you can go to right i've been on this website uh numerous times and it's, it's quite good there uh game it's game of the week game. game of the week is formula one racing if we can try the computer there again <laughs> And yeah. uh, I'm, I'm making, yeah, Chris is the producer, but we're making them work. Yeah, we're making them work for us this week. And now, it's Formula, Formula One racing. racing. Okay. They have the only license to actually license a game for Formula One racing. So if you're into racing games and you've got the steering wheel, which a lot of people you know have got it done, yeah. And all my, I've seen a lot of racing games, try a lot of racing games, okay. especially the Formula Racing ones. Yeah. I find that no matter how hard you try, you cannot turn a corner in them without crashing. Not one game I've tried yet. And is that with every joystick that you've used? Or? I've had them all. The, the, these cars well. will go up to... So Steve <laughs> has had every car game known. Every car game known. I've tried all the joysticks. And I guarantee you that you have to slow down to a complete stop to get around at any corner. Well, isn't it kind of like driving? You know they yeah, say I that... I walk the road every people, time I go People that corner. don't drive. So younger kids that don't drive and they're playing racing games are more into actually doing heavy turns, whereas people that actually do drive, that's right. realizing that if they did go around that corner that fast on their main streets, that they would be turning well, a little bit know. more cautious. I don't know. Okay, but try this game out. A lot of cars, uh, graphics are great. Right. Hopefully you have uh, some kind of 3D card to get the real essence of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a free download. And the demo is available uh, and a link off of our website at www.thecomputermechanics.com. Right. Okay, and we're going to go off and speak to Dean, I believe. Yep. Hi, Dean. Hello? Hi, is it Dean? No, it's Evan. Evan, okay. Hi, Evan. Hi, how Evan, are how are you? Good, how are you? Good, Good. thank you. Okay, um, just about your last caller who was talking about the ATI problem. Right. There is a solution, but I'm not at my computer, so I forgot what it is. But I spoke to the people at ATI, and there is a solution. Okay, oh. do you know where we can go and take a look at it? Um, not that I know of, but I'll call in next week and tell you how to fix that, okay? Could okay, or, or hit our message board. Could you okay, put that I'll on do that as well. Board? Sorry? Could you put that on the message board for us? Yeah, sure, that would be no problem. Okay, okay. and we're going to look for Evan. Okay. Capital letters, ATI volume problem. Okay. Okay. Excellent. And um, I have a bit of a problem with my computer. What happened was um, the fan over the hard drive um, died, and so did the modem, and I had all my files on the computer corrupt. Hmm. And, okay. And we got it fixed, and we have a new hard drive and a new modem, but still the computer is not working at all, and we erased all the files, and we tried reinstalling Windows 98, but there's still a problem with it, and we have no clue. Do you have any suggestions? Hmm. So your, your system overheated, did it? Um, I guess so. Is, and now they replaced the modem under yes. warranty? Um, it was under warranty, and we replaced the modem, and so did the fan. Okay, and so all your hard, hard, everything was corrupt on your hard drive. Yeah, so we had to erase everything. So, okay, what's so what's happening now is you're you're using a Windows 98 installation. Yeah. Okay, you're using the Windows 98 boot diskette. Yep. Yeah, uh, you have the Windows 98 CD in the CD-ROM. Mhm. Mm and you can get to a point of starting the setup. No, the Windows 98 is completely set up and it's working. Right, okay. But when you go inside, it's completely slow. You can't get on the Internet. A whole bunch of error messages come on. Wow. I'm wondering, I, I'm leaning towards, if they replace the modem 
and the fan had died in your system. Your system really overheated to a point that caused a problem with your modem as well. Mm -hmm. That you may be looking as well at Actually, problems with the motherboard. If it was a CPU fan and your your system overheated, it would probably just shut itself off. But you said it was the fan above your. Was it? Do you have uh, CPU chassis fans, um, or do you have chassis fans in your case? I don't know. Okay, was it the fan and the power supply? Do you know? I think it was. Yeah. Okay. I'm oh, gonna... okay. That would cause a problem. Definitely. Yeah. If it was a fan in the power supply, um, then you, you could, could, it could really it overheat. Still shut, it would still shut itself off, though. Eventually, okay. it would just get to the point where it would reboot itself. Yep. Or just power down. Well, it just for some reason it corrupted the files one day. We thought it might have been the Chernobyl virus, but it turned out that the fan was completely dead. Okay. Wow. And they didn't replace the hard drive. Um, no, they said the hard drive was fine, but they erased all the files and reinstalled Windows, but they I installed a new fan and a new modem. Okay, okay. Well, new and your, fan, sister's, new modem. your system's coming back, not allowing you to sign on to the internet. Yep. And you've gone through with your technical support at uh, your internet service provider. Yes. And you've got the dial-up adapter already set, all the networking functionality yep. for the modem. Like sometimes you can get on, but sometimes all these error messages come on. What kind of error message? General protection? Yeah. Um, it just says that the modem um, is it, not hooked up. But we checked all the connections and everything seemed to be hooked up perfectly fine. And it was just like before when it was working. Now okay. what, else, what else did you install when you set up? You said you, you had to reset up your modem, right? Um, well, we just installed the new drivers and a new modem. Did you okay. install any kind of fax software or anything like that? No. Okay. Okay. Did you do a diagnostic on the modem after the installation and it came back with everything okay? Yep. Okay, because that'll go through and send signals out to the modem. Now, was it exactly the same type of modem that they installed in your system you had before? No. It was a bit different. We used to have a 56 fax voice modem, but it's just a different brand name. Okay, because one of the things you may want to do is to go and see whether or not there's any updates to your modem okay. on mm -hmm. their website. Sometimes they'll have flash BIOS updates yep, for modems. What, what, do you know the name brand of the modem? Um, n not off the top of my head. They just okay. installed it. The other thing you may want to try is try moving your modem into a different slot. Okay. Okay. Because the technicians may have thought, okay, the modem's not working, and they replaced the modem, but it may not have been the modem. It actually could have been the slot, or so it may have been they did that because if you're still having it's problems with the modem, okay. Right now, I'm leaning towards that there may be a problem with the motherboard. If there was that much of an overheat and we had to replace certain things and we True. we had this problem, that you may have a problem with the motherboard itself. So you think we should just get a new CPU with everything new in it? Well, I, I, I would say that Sounds your like best bet you is, it is what you <laughs> want, right? A faster one? <laughs> well, probably a faster computer would be better, yeah. 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 Well, what I'd recommend, your system's still covered under warranty. Yep. Okay. Um, because yeah. of the types of errors that you're getting, and it's sometimes recognizing the modems there, and sometimes rec not, r not recognizing the modems there, I would recommend taking it back and saying that, well, since I've got my machine back, it's not worked properly, and you believe there's another internal problem. Okay. If there's mm -hmm. not another internal problem, you're probably looking at the minimum charge about an hour, and maybe they've got some switches that they can uh, change within. Maybe you've done something incorrectly in the installation that the technician can fix. Okay. And sometimes you're expected to pay some uh, a minimum charge about an hour, so they'll fix some software problems. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If not, I'm leaning towards that you may have something incorrect on Could the motherboard. Right. As well as, have you gone through all of the updates now for Windows 98 since you've redone this installation? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you've updated your browser? Yeah, it's the top of the line. Okay. Yeah, I would, I, I would say you're probably headed towards taking it back and asking them to look for other components that may have failed as well. Yeah. Okay. And since I can't get on the Internet right now, could I call back next week and tell you about the API? Yeah, you can give us Absolutely. a call back. Yeah. And, and hopefully by next week you will have brought it back, your system and get this problem solved, and then you can tell us all about it. Okay, well, thank you very much for your help. Right, okay, thank, thank you. Have a good, good night. Luck. See you. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Yep. Politeness gets you everywhere, and there yep. are a lot of very intelligent, as I say, every show. Yeah. And uh, I'd like to thank that. I'm waiting for his reply back on the ATI right. now, wave. Now, he was saying, mm -hmm. like, I had a thought while he, when he was saying that um, his system overheated. Overheating? I had a thought. Yeah, I had a thought, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway. Um, it, it's sort of like if your system gets struck by lightning or yeah. it goes down the lines, mm -hmm. 
right at that very moment, everything may be fine. Yeah. But a couple of weeks down the road, right, then you're running the problems. With, so with that the time that yes. he took it into the service depot, it might have been fine. And yeah. then he gets it back home, and you run into more problems. Overheating and lightning strikes are basically, they can do the same sort of thing. And, and that's, that's the best thing to do. To, if it's under warranty, rather than trying to diagnose the problem yourself, take it in. Yeah. If you think it's a software-related issue, yep. see, a lot of, and, and be polite to the technician. Always remember that that's not the guy that built right. your machine, and he's right. not the one causing the problem. And a really good thing, too, if you're running into problems and you get error messages that do come up on the screen, write those down. Yeah. Keep a little journal, just write it down. So when you bring it in, they're going to know a lot more about what that error could mean or mm -hmm. what direction to go into. Opposed, whereas you wouldn't understand what that error means. Uh, the worst thing a support person can get is someone calling up and saying, my computer had an error. <laughs> I was doing this and, <laughs> and something had an popped error up. And you should know and it. And I have not a clue as to what one of the millions of errors it was, exactly. but it had an error. Can you fix it, please? And, and I've, yeah. Have you happens. ever gone to a computer system and someone's been having a problem and it just doesn't seem to happen when you're there? Exactly. That's that exactly happens all the time, yeah. too. Usually, when I, if it doesn't happen right away, I just get up and sort of pretend I'm leaving, yeah. and it'll happen. And that, that's when it pops <laughs> so back. So then I come back. You quickly turn your head. <laughs> okay, we're going to go off. We're going to speak to Dean. Dean? Yes, hello. Hi, Hi. it's Dean. Yes, uh, I have a question about a scanner. Okay. Uh, yeah, whenever I put the card in, it's a, it's a 1502. Uh, it, it came with the snap scan, uh, a Gaffey scanner. Okay. And uh, whenever I put the uh, the card in the uh, ISA slot, and I boot the system, uh, uh, the system freezes and it and it doesn't go through its full boot. It doesn't go to Windows. And I have a feeling I I think it might be a, a driver issue. Yeah. But, uh, mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure. I thought you might be able to shed some light on that. Where, where does it go to? Does it go to the starting Windows 98 or 95 page? Yeah, it just goes to that that page and it doesn't go any further. If like CMOS, CMOS recognizes it, okay. but that's as far as it goes. The CMOS recognizes it. Mm. Okay, now what that that card? Oh, that is that a that's just an ISA card you said, right? Yeah. So what does that so use an IRQ? It, yeah, I think it is does. It, is it a SCSI card? Yes, it is. Okay. SCSI. Uh, sometimes you you may want to look in in. I'm thinking that uh, it could be a driver issue, as you're saying. What you may want to do is you may want to go into safe mode. Right. So when it does pop up and say starting Windows 98, you press the F8 key, right. mm -hmm. and then you'll get a menu option that says go into safe mode. Okay. So if you go into safe mode, then your system should boot up, be it that that card's in there or not. Okay. Right. Once I'm there? Once you're there, go into the control panel and go into system, the device manager. Right. Okay and take a look whether or not that card shows up at all. I see. Okay, if it's not, sh if it does show up, I would recommend removing it. Mm -hmm. Now the other thing you may want to do, and I've actually seen this happen, is that even though the Windows 98 starting screen is up, mm -hmm. that's really just over top of everything that's happening in the background as it's booting through DOS to get yeah. you to the uh, Windows 98 operating system. I understand. Mm -hmm. If you hit the escape key, what you should see is something behind there. Right, I, I've done that, yeah. Okay. Sometimes uh, it was something waiting for a prompt or, mm -hmm. or a question, uh, as well as did you do any installations that may have loaded drivers into the config.sys file or the autoexec.bat? Uh, no. Okay. No, so all not. you've done is just put the card in. Well, I've, I've reinstalled a couple of times. and uh, uh, Well, the first time I, I installed the, the whole CD uh, that involves with the, uh, uh, the scanner itself, and uh, but I, I think uh, it's I've moved a couple of times. Uh, there there was an installation for the uh, SCSI card, and I I, I actually uh, I went to uh, a Gaffey looking for that driver. Okay. But, uh, I didn't see anything on their website for that particular card, so uh, I think it's just a matter of. Uh, there, there's there's not a lot there's not a lot of SCSI card manufacturers out there. Adaptech is that the what he said it was? was is it Adaptech? The SCSI card. Uh, sorry, a Gaffey. A Gaffey. Uh, I th I'm not sure. Okay. Because one of the things is because did he say at any point that the, the, at any point did this card work? Yeah, it did. Okay, and you said you moved and stuff, and yeah. you moved stuff around. Yeah. Then probably Les's suggestion about um, going into safe mode and going to the device Re manager. Remove the card. Remove the card completely. Uninstall any software relating to it, mm -hmm. and then start over from scratch and let yeah. your system refine that card again. 
Because if you if you had drivers in there that were correctly installed, what happens is they'll it'll copy a file called an INF file into an INF directory underneath Windows. Okay. And that's where all the drivers are chosen from. So the next time you go and re-add that card, so you could actually remove the card right out of the system, mm -hmm. boot into Windows 98, right. device manager, and remove any reference to that card. Yeah. Okay? Okay. Once you've done that, place the card back into the machine, mm -hmm. reboot the machine, like turn off the machine first, I'm, I'm skipping parts, right. but put the card back into the turn machine, off, yeah. turn on the computer system, and it should recognize that card is there and load the appropriate drivers. Because Windows 98 came with a lot of drivers of its own right. that I find seem to work a bit better than the ones that come from the manufacturer. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so give that a try. I will. And then, and then also, uh, you may want to use the original diskettes that came, what was working in the first place, mm -hmm. and go from there. Okay. Okay. All right, well, thanks for your help. Not All a right. problem. Good luck with thanks. that. Thanks. Right. Sometimes I find removing the card, mm -hmm. uh, or even if you're installing a package, doing a reinstallation of the package will set things back to the original default. Okay, we're going to go off and speak to Danielle. Daniel? Hi, Daniel. Yes, hi. How are you doing? Good. Pretty you? good. Great show, I might say. Thank you. I just had a quick question regarding Internet Explorer 5 that I'm running right now. Internet Explorer 5. Okay. Uh, when I download from some sites, uh, MP3s and stuff, uh, sometimes, you know, when the menu comes up and gives you an option to save it to a different directory? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's not asking me that anymore. It's just automatically... Uh, stores it into a, a Windows 98 d temporary directory. So you click on the file you want, right? And it just so if you were to right click on it mm -hmm. and go save target as. Yes, I've done that too. Still the same thing. And then it, it doesn't remember from afterwards. Doesn't remember. No, it just automatically back to temporary directory. Okay, so it defaults back because it should mm -hmm. once you right click on those files remember. But different sites. Different sites. Some sites, it's okay. It comes up and allows me to uh, save it where, wherever I want it. But on some sites, it just automatically saves it into uh, a temporary directory. I think. I think what's happened is, when when you go to save a file, when you click on a file to do a download, yeah. Microsoft would always give you this box that says, "Do you want to open this file from the location right. on the internet, or do you want to save this file down to a directory on your hard drive?" Mm -hmm. But there's an, another option there, a little check mark that says, do not ask me this question again. Yeah, I've done that too. For that particular file type. Okay. Okay. So if you had actually checked that off and said, save this file to a location, the next time you clicked on, let's say it was a zip file, uh, ZIP. That happens only with MP3 files. For some reason, when I download different MP3 files from different sites, okay. that's when it does that. With some sites, it's okay. Okay. So what what you're but but for MP3 files, what's happened is the three extensions, the letters at the very end, mm -hmm. have somehow been turned off within your browser, mm -hmm. so you automatically save it, and that's why it comes up to the directory, uh, but it's a Windows temporary directory. Mm -hmm. yeah. what, what I'd recommend doing is, and that'll also sometimes happen if you install a a player, yep, that yeah. decides to take over the use of MP3s or any other type of file ADI, format. Videos. Right? Okay. So what it does is it sets itself up so when you actually do click on that file type, it should automatically launch. That. Right? Layer. You'll find a lot of applications mm. want to fight over different types of file formats. Right. right. Uh, so what you'll need to do is <laughs> go into, you know, there, you can actually go in and, and do you. a repair. Mm -hmm. I believe that may reset them. Okay. As well as you can go into my computer, mm -hmm. right, into one of the boxes, go mm -hmm. view, uh, folder options, and then program extensions. Okay. Find MP3 and delete it. Okay. Yeah, that's the only thing I haven't done so far. Okay. When you delete it, Window is not gonna, Windows will not have a clue as to how to uh, use this MP3 file. So it'll MP3 ask file. you from there on in. So then it'll start asking that. you again. Okay. Okay. It's, it's not, nothing to do with the uh, actual websites that I go to, right? It, it depends on what commands you're sending over, but if you're finding it's actually, happening on more than one website... Mm -hmm. Actually, yes. You know what? I've actually done that, and there was one site, it was an MP3 site, I click on the file, and it never even gave me a choice, now that I'm thinking about mm -hmm. it. Yeah. It just automatically downloaded it to the Windows temp file. You got it. That's exactly and I had to right-click on every one of them if I wanted to put them in my MP3 file. Absolutely, yeah. So there is sites out there, I'm not right, sure how many there is, does right that will do that. Does right-clicking work for you? 
Uh, right click the same thing, the same thing. Just I, I to save as a target. Still picks it up and throws it into a template. But does it not give you a choice to browse to a different directory? Uh, no, it doesn't give me that choice. It just so automatically. You're, picks you're it up. saying that it gives you a See, choice. See, I, I was given a choice. If I right clicked on it and said save target here, no, no then I was given a choice. Doesn't so probably falling back to what yeah. last was saying. Go through and remove the extension underneath folders. Yeah. Uh, folder options under view. Right. And then program find MP3 and remove it. Okay. Or another, and then after you've done that, reinstall your MP3 player of choice, Winamp or Sonic okay. or. Okay. Okay. Okay, and then that should G2. work for you. Yeah, I've got. Thanks for the help. Okay. okay. Thanks. Thanks. Good luck. And we're going to speak to Doran. Hi, Doran. Hi again. How are you? Very good. I'm the uh, guy a couple weeks ago who uh, gave you the testimonial on Sonic and uh, ah. helped, helped, oh, yeah, that, yeah. helped that guy resize the Outlook window. Oh, Actually, okay. Oh, yeah. Right, right um, How are you doing? Good. Now, Stephen, I want to make sure that that MP3 you're downloading is a legal one, right? All, always legal. All legal. Oh, of course. Yeah. You can come to our house, or actually my house, and, and note that everything's been purchased and legal and, yep. and right down the line. I'll make sure to do a little raid later on tonight. Yeah, there you go. Um, <laughs> I, uh, for all of the stuff I've learned over the years on my computer, this is a pretty simple question that probably has a simple answer, and it's more of an information question on the speed of Windows. Um, I installed WordPerfect 2000 this week mm -hmm. and decided to install a bunch of new fonts. Okay. And w it, it warned me if you have more than 500 fonts, it'll severely slow down Windows. Yes. And so I, 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 I ignored it, installed about 600, and it just slowed things down a lot. And so I deleted a couple hundred. And uh, what I wanted to know about, first of all, fonts was how the heck do fonts slow down the running of Windows? Because it, lo it, load it loads the entire directory and being prepared for different applications. So that's one of the shared. Uh, functionalities of Windows, uh, the, the ability for fonts. So some of the fonts that you did the installation with in WordPerfect will also be available, say, in a, a package called WordPad that comes with Windows 98. Right. So, so it, it, just even for other people's knowledge as well, is it a good idea to really keep your fonts directory down to a minimum? I, I well, especially if you get warned that it's going to slow down your system. <laughs> well, yeah. You know what? In in all my years of working in the computer field, I. I offices, businesses, uh, schools, off, you know, stuff like that. Uh -huh. People only have a few, say, five to ten fonts that they really use on a regular basis. The only reason I installed a lot of them was because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to put together a nice web page and I wanted lots of different choices of fonts just to try them. Yeah. Right. And once I realized that 99% of them look exactly alike, uh, it helped a lot to bring them down. Right. Uh, the other thing about speed, and this was a little bit more important, was I always keep the resource meter running in the in, in, the, in the tray to see how things are going. Now, first of all, as a basic question, I don't know the difference between the three uh, the three indications. They have one's called system, one's called user, and one's called GDI, and it shows what percentage uh, each one is available. And the GDI is usually around 90 or 80 percent available, and and the other two are usually pretty similar in, in amount, mm -hmm. and they keep going down as the amount of uh, things I'm running. Opening mm -hmm. windows, I can open understand that. Like that. That's pro that probably just means uh, the amount of uh, the amount of resources left in the machine for other programs. Right. The problem I'm, I'm concerned about is that when I run um, when I run a lot of programs, I'll have multitasking and it goes really down to like 30 percent or something, mm -hmm. and then I'll very often just clear it all up, just close all those programs. And it never goes back up? It right very to often doesn't go back up, and I'm wondering if that means stuff is stuck in memory or something. I'll sometimes run mem turbo to like right. clear out my memory, and it still doesn't help. And, and I have to restart the computer to get some resources back. So I'm wondering, mm -hmm. are those right. resources processor, are they memory, and how do you get them And your up? virtual swap files, stuff is also left onto there. It's oh, really? It, so yeah. when you reboot, that all gets cleared, and especially your memory and stuff, right? So once you reboot the system, all that stuff gets cleared out. So what's the, is there a way to, without rebooting, get some of that, those resources back? Well, there are some applications that you can load that will keep, tra again, we're loading. Right. And notice that when you ran the re resource meter and the first thing it came up and told you that it would be taking up some resources absolutely. as well? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so what happens is when you run out, one of the big culprits, try running MS Office. Uh, well. I'm not sure about WordPerfect 2000, I haven't seen it. It's very, uh, but if any WordPerfect yeah. product just goes if you run Word and then close off, it'll never go back to up to where it was before. Right. Uh, now, some people sometimes that's considered a bug, uh, memory leak. Okay, yep. where it takes up a certain. It's like kind of like defragging your hard drive, and that's right. why it creates all those CHK files. Right. Well, I'm running uh, Norton Utilities, and I've got like the the single uh, the single uh, swap file going, 
And okay. It's a, it's a, it's not a, not a, not a variable size. It's mm-hmm. one size they say is the way they, they recommend. And I've got it running, and it's, I got like 128 uh, swap file plus my, my 128 memory, and I, and I'm running a 333 chip. So I'm, I would think that I'd have more going, but I find it really gets bogged down if I run too many applications. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there's no, is, is there anything to recover it during a, during a Windows session? Uh, so there, there are programs so, yeah, that you can actually get resources back, but then again, it's going to use up a little bit of resources to get them back. Yeah, as, you, so ha- as you have more and more packages loaded, right. okay, or programs running, yeah. the most important thing at that point is to have as much memory as possible, not virtual memory, because then you're using the hard drive. Oh, okay, okay. So it's actual memory. But to have as much actual memory as possible. So if I'm doing those kind of things, if I went from 128 to 256, I'd see a real improvement. Uh, well, I, I just did that. And I went from 128 to 256, and I noticed that I can load more applications and have a lot less problems as I'm d- using my applications. Really? Okay? And I did, but I didn't notice a big difference. Like, my games aren't running fast or anything like that. Right. But also note that if you're going to increase the amount of memory, it's also going to want to increase the amount of swap space that Which it means uses. means more hard drive spaces. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So right. it's kind of a buy-off. But if you do go with the memory upgrade, you're going to find better performance for opening up multiple applications. Okay. So those okay. indications are in the right, We're going to have to, we're, we're gonna have to wrap here. up. All right, take care. We've got to wrap it up. Thanks very much. And we're going to see you next Saturday. I'm off to the cottage. All right. Take care. Okay, take care. Bobachev is headed to the bench. Calgary will have six attackers. Right at him, right Oh, that one just missed. A bouncing puck deflected. Still loose. Back in front. Beats with a chance. Back up top. There's a shot. High. Bouncing into the corner. Moran has it for Brendel. He can't get it. Zoltek with a chance to clear it. 30 seconds to go. Can't do it. Keach gets it in. Beach has it. Dodging horse. Centering it out. Hits the side of the net. Brendel. Get it out, Moran with a shot! Got it to save! 16.9 seconds to go. The net empty for Calgary, and what a flurry. Kotick, big time save. 
This is a chance where Pavel Brendel is the giver, the passer, instead of the shooter. He gets a couple chances himself, but the last one, this is a shot from the point by Rich. He gets it eight miles high. Nobody's gonna go and deflect that chip puck. But chasing it in behind the net, that's dodging horse. Eight right on the right-hand side of your screen. I think it's Brendel that ends up going behind the net and making a great pass to Moran. There's Brendel. Moran right at the side, quick shot. Excellent, excellent position by Kotick. And is he happy that he knows that puck is underneath him? Seamus Kotick, his second straight start for the Ottawa 67s. And there you see the 20 saves, the 20th one. So important. Timeout. Dean Clark wants his team to get organized with 16.9 seconds to go. Four to three is the score. Again, a berth in the semifinals on Saturday on the line here. Now let me tell you something. When you've only lost 13 games during the season, you haven't had a lot of practice at playing with your net empty. So this is a brand new experience, or certainly a fairly new experience for that group of athletes right there. Shots on goal favoring Ottawa 28 to 23. Dan Tessier with the go-ahead goal, but the Ottawa 67s under pressure now. Fans trying to cheer on this last 16 seconds, but the face-off will be in the Ottawa zone. Calgary's net is empty. And don't forget what we saw with Pavel Brendel earlier tonight. Hadn't talked about him much in terms of scoring. Talked about the fact that he was almost invisible until he scored a power play goal. He is on the point right now. Moran set to take the draw against Dan Tessier. Brad Moran, Dan Tessier. From the faceoff. Pavel Brendel has it. Out in front. There it is. Oh, and Moran had a great chance but couldn't get it home. Whistle down with 6.4 seconds to go. Off the faceoff, the puck does come back to Brendel. He does a pretty good job. He's a right-hand shot. He's got to make a fairly difficult cross ice pass here. These are sometimes picked off. That's the pass right there. Look how close that comes to being picked off. Watch the puck go through the crease area, right to the guy that you wish would get it. It hops over a stick. That might be a bad luck play from Calgary. He's in perfect position, Moran is, but Kevin, that's the ice there. It hops right over his stick. He's ready to shoot the puck into the net. And after the play, of course, lots of pushing and shoving. Brent dodging horse without his helmet. Seamus Kotick trying to weather a Calgary storm that has just 6.4 seconds left to try and tie this game up. Brad Moran, 60 goals during the regular season, came so close to getting his third goal of the Memorial Cup. Pat Smola. Yeah, that was just unfortunate. Just so close. Moran, he's in perfect position. You know, on a good sheet of ice, this puck lays flat. Watch the backhand. It's almost a pass to nobody in particular. Bang, he's just ready to pop that thing upstairs because Kotick was making a great sliding say, uh, position to get across the front of the net and it just hopped over his stick. Same face off, same corner of the ice, 6.4 seconds left. Brad Moran will be taking the draw for the Hitman against number three for Ottawa, Dan Tessier. Again, the Calgary net is empty. Brendel, the only one back. From the faceoff, here's a chance for Campbell to get it out. Can't do it, Beach, shot on net, Campbell will get it out, and that is the game. The Ottawa 67s have now won two games here. And this one may not be bigger than the one they play on Sunday. Seamus Kotick being mobbed by his teammates at the fans here at the sold-out Ottawa Civic Center, giving their team a standing ovation. Wow.
They worked hard, they fell behind, but good teams find a way to win the game when everything's on the line, but it was very, very tough for Calgary tonight. They just maybe got a little bit too short staffed to play against that great hockey team right there. Dan Tessier with the winning goal, the 67.